So we've had a lot of questions during the last couple of weeks regarding times and seasons. And what we thought we'd do um, this week is spend our time to kind of look at a few of those times and seasons um, that come up in the Bible to look at the time periods that are given to us and um, kind of just walk through them and see how how relevant they are, I guess you could say, to um, the circumstances that we are in today. So we're going to begin um, by taking a look at the, um, the situation that we have in the Bible when it comes to this. And, and it's an important verse, I think, is Mark chapter 13 and uh, verse 32, where we read, Of that day and the hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels in heaven. So that's a pretty critical thing, I think, is that um, that's something that is not in our purview to know, and that is the day or the hour when things are going to be taking place. Those are given to us in a very clear sense um, that this is something that the Father has in his power, not something that we have in our power. So the, even the Son in Matthew or Mark chapter 13, verse 32, didn't have access to that information. This was something that was yet to be revealed to him. Now, come in, you, if you would, in your Bible to um, Acts chapter 1, because I think this is an important passage. It kind of mirrors um, what we just looked at in Mark, because in Acts chapter 1, what we have here is a section, basically, where the disciples are asking the same question uh, again of the Lord Jesus Christ. So in Acts chapter 1, in verse 6, When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And the Lord said to them, It's not for you to know the times and the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. And the problem is, is that we kind of, that's, that verse is used kind of along with Mark saying, well, we don't know the day and the hour and, um, and we don't know the time and the season. So we don't really need to, to spend any time looking at the prophetic word or anything along that lines. Now, what is missed though, is the next verse. And that's verse eight, where he says, you shall receive power after that the Holy Spirit is come upon you. So it wasn't for them to know the time or the season which the Father had put in his power when they wanted to know, is it at this time you're going to restore again the kingdom to Israel? But he turns around and says to them that you're going to receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you're going to be witnesses of me all over the place. So so that's the crux of this, is that it wasn't for them to know right then, but they would receive power after a certain period of time. And so that's what we get when we come to the book of Revelation. That was revealed to them. The revelation, and we read in Revelation chapter 1, verses 1 to 3, the revelation or the revealing the apocalypse of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it, meaning to express by sign or symbol, um, by his angel to his servant John. And if we keep reading on, down in verse 3, he says, Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. So it's a critical little piece of information that we have been given to us here, is that the revelation was to show them times and seasons. It's to show them things that were shortly to come to pass. And they received it, of course, after they received the Holy Spirit, which moved men to write, right? So holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. The apostle John is moved by the Holy Spirit to write down the things that he writes in the book of Revelation. And these things show them the things that are coming, the things that are shortly come to pass. Granted, they're given in sign and symbol, they're signified, and it it tells them that the time is at hand. So the beginning of of the giving of this information is, is upon them. So that's kind of where we begin in our studies on times and seasons. And we want to kind of roll all the way back. We're not going to start in the book of Revelation. We're actually going to flip all the way back to the book of Genesis. And if you want to turn to Genesis chapter 1, we're going to begin kind of like with the macro view. So you've got micro view, which is the real small, fine detail. Macro view is the big, big picture. So we're going to start with the big picture when it comes to times and seasons. And we as Christadelphians are fairly familiar with this idea. We have the 7,000-year plan 
that we like to share with our interested friends, and it's modeled on creation. And this is where we really begin when it comes to looking at times and seasons, and God gives us some really helpful information in here um, in this whole idea of the times and the seasons because we have given to us right at the very beginning in Genesis chapter 1 what or how to begin this whole process of understanding it. So Genesis chapter 1, if you look at verse 14, God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night, and let them be, and notice the wording here, for signs, for seasons, for days, and for years. So we may have missed that before. We may have thought, okay, they're for seasons, they're for days, and they're for years, and we understand that part of it. But we may have missed the fact that they're also for signs. And so that idea in the book of Revelation, that there was going to be signs uh, to be express something by sign or symbol, it's going to use the, the days, months, and years, the sun and the moon, as symbols that are going to express time periods for us. And so, of course, God makes two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. And a little, you know, caveat there, he made the stars also just kind of thrown in, um, which I always think is probably one of the greatest understatements ever. Um, but it's it's kind of a neat little, little part where God points out to us that he made the stars also. So we have here the seven days of creation, which basically are there. They're going to be for signs, seasons, days, and years. So that's what our class is all about tonight, is looking at these signs, seasons, days, and years. Now, as we keep on reading in the book of Revelation, um, we find out, or sorry, in the book of Genesis, we find out that God rests on the seventh day from all the work which he had made. And of course, we know that that would become the Sabbath day. And we're not going to spend the time to go into the law to look at this, but it would become the Sabbath day where God rests. So this is our first pattern that we have, is the seven days of creation which are given to us for signs. And so we say, well, what exactly does this mean? Well, if we go over to the New Testament now and we look at what Peter has to say, so if you turn in your Bible over to um, 2 of Peter chapter 3, we have in 2 Peter chapter 3 um, the same concept. Um, and it's taking days and it's saying now they're no longer literal days, but they're expanded out. And we're actually given in Peter the macro vision, the big picture. So in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 8, we read, Beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. So we're given a macro picture. Each of those days of creation represent a thousand years. So we have 6,000 years of man's kind of rule on the earth, so to speak, and the seventh day of rest where God rested. Now, is this, you know, a Christadelphianism? Sometimes people get a little excited about that. Well, no, it's not, because we see here that there remains a rest for the people of God. And we read that he has entered um, in, in uh, Hebrews chapter 4 and verses 9 through 11. There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. For he that has entered into his rest, he also has ceased from his own works as God did from his. Let us labor therefore to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. So there is a rest for the people of God. Right? So this is the seventh day. Just as God rested on the seventh day, the seventh thousandth year is a rest because a day is with the Lord as a thousand years. So there's your seven thousand years. And on the seventh day, God rested. That's the millennial period. And so when we, we look at this and we kind of lay out the, the years and we consider how, the, you know, it began in 4,000, then we come up to the year zero and then 1,000, 2,000, and we're kind of like squeaking into the seventh day. 2020, that's the 7,000 year plan of God with the earth, and the seventh day of rest is upon us. We are at the dawn of that seventh day. So that's the, the macro picture that God gives us of the, the plan and purpose that he has, and we use it with our interested friends, and to say, look, this is God's plan with the earth. It comes out of Hebrews and Peter and goes right the way back to Genesis, and I think it's a fairly commonly understood and fairly commonly um, 
defensible kind of piece of, of scriptural analogy where we have those days, as Genesis says, they're for signs and seasons and for, um, and, and uh, uh, well, they're going to be for wonders as well as we're going to see. So let's take a look now at the next little piece, which is the day for a year principle. So that's the big picture, the 7,000 years. A, a day is the Lord with a, is with a thousand years. But we also have this day for a year principle. And we'd like to kind of jump in and look at this um, right where it begins back in Numbers. So it doesn't begin in, in prophetic terms. It comes actually out of Numbers. And it comes out of the time period with Moses, the children of Israel, wandering through the wilderness. So in Numbers chapter 14 and verse 32, we read there, As for you, your carcasses, um, they shall fall in this wilderness, and your children shall wander forty years, and bear your whoredoms until your carcasses be wasted in the wilderness. After the number of the days in which you searched the land, even forty days, each day for a year, you will bear your iniquities, even 40 years, and ye shall know my breach of promise. So here we have the situation where there is literally given to us a day for a year principle. 40 days that they went and spied the land out, 40 years that Israel is now going to wander in the wilderness because of their wickedness. Now, that same principle is applied elsewhere. So just kind of putting the math on the screen there, we have 40 days that are going to cover this 40-year period. Now, the same principle comes up in Ezekiel. In Ezekiel chapter 4, um, verse 4 to 6, Ezekiel is told to lay on his side according to the number of the days that thou shalt lie, shalt lie upon it, thou shalt bear their iniquity. I have laid upon thee the years of their iniquity according to the number of the days. 390 days, so shalt thou bear the iniquity of the house of Israel. And when thou hast accomplished them, lie again on thy right side, and thou shalt bear the iniquity for the house of Judah 40 days. I have appointed thee again, and here's the principle, each day for a year. So 390 days for Israel and 40 days um, he would have there for uh, the tribe of Judah. So 390 years using the day for a year principle and 40 years using the same day for a year principle. So there's Ezekiel and there's numbers. And I think we can agree those are pretty clearly delineated for us. They're laid out pretty well. So now let's jump into some of the more prophetic ones. I mean, this one is actually prophetic, but let's look at the longer term ones um, just to see how this works out. Let's go to the book of Daniel and um, we want to go to chapter 9 in Daniel. So those are a couple of examples of how God does this on a more macro level. So Daniel chapter 9, and this is where we, we really want to sort of dive in and kind of get the idea. Now, we're not going to do a, um, a, an exposition on the 70 weeks prophecy. Um, we don't have time for that tonight. I just want to use it to illustrate a point. And the point is, is how accurate uh, God's time periods are. So if we come to Daniel chapter 9, we have here the 70 weeks prophecy where we read 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon the holy city. So this is Daniel 9 verse 24. To finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up the vision of the prophecy and the prophecy and to anoint the holy. And so this is the, the time period that's given. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah, the prince shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. And after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. The people of the prince shall come and destroy the city and the sanctuary. And the end there uh, will be with a flood unto the end of the war, desolations are determined. Now, I just want to like little asterisks here. We're going to jump out of this for one second. Remember, we looked at last week how that the coming of the days of the Son of Man, and we mentioned that AD 70 was the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ in judgment against Jerusalem. And somebody had asked the question, well, how is Jesus coming against Jerusalem when the Romans actually came against Jerusalem? Just note there what it says in that passage. Um, the people, verse 26, the people of the prince shall come and destroy the city and the sanctuary. 
So the Lord deputizes the Roman armies, because remember he says that all power in heaven and earth is given unto me. He deputizes the Roman armies, and he uses them to come in judgment against Israel. So that's what we're understanding by that. But rolling back then from that, that's last week's class, and I apologize if I'm, I'm rambling on here and confusing you a little bit, but if we look now at the 70 weeks prophecy, what we're told, we're given a time period from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. So the command to build Jerusalem was 456 BC. And if we travel on that seven weeks and then 62 weeks, we come out to the time period of Messiah the Prince. This is the time period when all this is taking place. This is the time of Messiah the Prince. And so Jesus would come. It begins in that last week, the first half of the week, three and a half years of John the Baptist's ministry, and the last half of the week, three and a half years of the Lord's ministry. And then, of course, Messiah um, would be cut off at the end of that time period. And what's interesting is we find that in Israel, at that period of time, or in Judah, um, we find Simeon. Uh, in Luke chapter 2, in verse 25, he's a devout man, and he's waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. You see, people knew that this was the time period. Remember the Magi who would come and they would seek for the Messiah, the one who was to be born. They understood um, that this was the time period that he was to be born. And um, it's taken from Daniel. They came from the east, probably from one of the cities, the royal cities out in the east. And they had the book of Daniel there, no doubt. And they had determined that this was the time period. And of course, they'd seen the star and they were looking for this time period. So there were people waiting for the consolation of Israel, both in the land and further afield as well. So again, a very accurate time period from 456 B.C., right the way through to the time of the Lord Jesus Christ um, to 33 AD at the very end, that's 70 weeks prophecy. So a week is given, there's seven days in a week, and so we have a total of, um, of all those periods basically rolling out until the Lord Jesus Christ would come. So that's another one of those. And I just want to use that as an example because it's all gone. There's not a whole lot of debate about it. Um, it's a thing of the past. Um, it's come, it's gone, it's expired. The Lord Jesus Christ came as, it's, as it said he would. And of course, um, the rest of the, 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 the prophecy has come to, to, come to pass. We want to look, though, at Daniel chapter 8 now. So just flick back over a page because we have here something that is a 2300-day prophecy. So this, this is an interesting one. Um, I find it absolutely fascinating. It was one of the first time periods for me as a young man that I actually looked at and put pen to paper and kind of like was able to figure it out. And it was really quite exciting. So we're just going to take our time and, and think about this. And you're probably amused that I said we're going to take our time. So I'm going to try and slow down and just roll through this so it makes sense. So Daniel chapter 8 a little bit of the context, first of all. So we're looking at um, the passage, basically, that has to do with the ram and the goat. So if you look at Daniel chapter 8 and verse 2, Daniel is in Shushan, the palace in the province of Elam, and he sees a vision by the river Ulai. And so what he sees here is a ram that's standing, and the ram signifies the Medes and the Persians, um, and they're standing. They're no longer active. Their empire has kind of like exhausted itself. And what he sees coming is a ram, or the ram, sorry, had been pushing westwards and southwards and eastward, but now it is standing. But what is coming upon him in verse 5, I was considering and behold, an he goat came from the west on the face of the whole earth, and he has a notable horn between his eyes. And so this is Alexander the Great, the first king of the Greeks. It tells you that in verse 21, and it tells you in verse 20 that the ram is the Medes and the Persians. Well, Alexander the Great comes and he smites this goat, and then, of course, um, his horn is broken off and four more come in its place. And the empire is divided into four. And out of those one, one of those four, a little horn comes along um, in verse 9. And notice what he does. His career, that is he waxes exceeding great towards the south, towards the east, and towards the pleasant land, which is, of course, the land of Israel. And he waxes great 
to the host of heaven and cast down um, the, the stars to the ground and stamped upon them. Remember last week we were talking about how that the stars of the heavens of the future age are all about um, the powers that would fall in the time of um, the Apostle Peter. He talks about that the heavens and the earth that are now are going to be falling. Um, well, that's the same thing that had happened here, is that there was going to be stars of the heaven falling. And in verse 11, he says, He magnified himself even to the prince of the host, and by him the daily sacrifice was taken away, the place of the sanctuary was cast down. So this is actually uh, talking about the same period that the Lord Jesus Christ was talking about in the Olivet Prophecy. The stars are going to fall to the ground. That is the Jewish heavens and earth. They're collapsing. We're going to have him come along and he's going to destroy the sanctuary and cast it down. Well, that's what the Lord Jesus Christ was referring to in the Olivet Prophecy. And of course, Daniel, seeing this prophecy, is greatly distressed. And in verse 13, he hears this conversation going on. And that's where we're kind of jumping in. So verse 13, I heard one saint speaking to another saint that said unto that certain saint, which spake, how long shall be the vision? Now, take out the italics, the daily and the transgression of desolation to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot. And he said, unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. So the question is, how long is this vision going to be during which the ram smites the goat and it ends up with the sanctuary being cast down, which was what we looked at in Luke, and basically until the sanctuary is cleansed. Well, this is the time period that the Lord Jesus Christ is referring to in Luke chapter 21. So flip over to Luke chapter 21, and let's just have a look at what it has to say. So in Luke chapter 21, we have there this same time period. And remember that Daniel had talked about the host being cast down, the sanctuary and the host being trodden underfoot. Now listen to the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. They shall fall by the edge of the sword and be led away captive into all nations. Jerusalem shall be trodden down the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Now, the times of the Gentiles isn't just a generic term. It is referring to the time period of the Gentiles, which is the time period that we just looked at in Daniel. That was the 12, 200 or 2,300 days, right? So that was the period that had been given. 2,300 days, and then the sanctuary will be cleansed. Now, as we've been looking at the Olivet Prophecy, this is one of the major time periods that we need to concern ourselves with because the Olivet Prophecy, as we talked about, it, it is about AD 70, but this part of it links it right the way forward with the period that we're dealing with today. So, Let's take a look at what somebody wrote many years ago. And this is a very interesting little passage. It's written by a guy named Thomas Newton. He wrote a book called Dissertations on the Prophecies in 1754. And he said, The transgression of desolation has now continued these 1700 years, being that he's writing in 1754. They expect, and we expect, that at length the sanctuary will be cleansed, because that's what Daniel had said. And that in God's determined time, his promise would be fully accomplished. I will return and build again the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. I will build up the ruins thereof, and I will set it up, that the residue of men might seek after the Lord, and all the Gentiles upon whom my name is called, saith the Lord, who doeth all these things. So that's what he wrote back in 1754. He says, look, it's been a long time, but we believe that at the end of that period, the sanctuary is going to be cleansed. Now, he goes a little bit further than this. He says, our Savior's words are very memorable. Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. It is still trodden down to the Gentiles, and consequently, the times of the Gentiles are not fulfilled. When the times of the Gentiles shall be fulfilled, then the expression implies that Jews shall be restored. Okay, so that's what Thomas Newton wrote in 1754. Now, we're going to leave Uncle Thomas here for a minute. 
or Bishop Thomas, I guess he would be. Um, and we're just going to look at Daniel again to just pick up the actual time period. So Daniel chapter 8. Now we want to focus now on the time period in verse 14. So how long shall be this vision that's going to give both the sanctuary, which is the, the temple area, the temple mount, and the host, the Jewish people, to be trodden underfoot? And he's told it's 2,300 days and then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. So that's the period we're looking at, 2,300 days. So the question comes, as it does with all these prophecies, well, when exactly does that time period begin? How do we kind of understand what this means? And so um, if we take a look at what Thomas Newton wrote, it's quite fascinating. Because remember, he's writing in 1754. That's a few years ago. So he says, I conceive the time period is to be computed from the invasion of the he-goat or Alexander's invading Asia. Alexander invaded Asia in the year of the world 3670, in the time before Christ 334. Now, he invaded, um, he crossed the, the, the Hellespont in, in 334, but he actually attacked the goat. The real battle that took place was the Battle of Issus in the year 333. So we'll forgive him that little little. Uh, foible, but but you get the general idea. So, but notice this: he says, two thousand three hundred years from that time will draw towards the conclusion of the sixth millennium of the world, and about that period, according to an old tradition which was current before our Savior's time, going right the way back to Daniel, of course, um, founded upon the prophecies, great changes and revolutions are expected. Rome is to be overthrown, and the Jews are to be restored. Well, that's pretty cool. So back when I was probably 19 years old, I sat down with pen and paper and I f tried to figure this out. So I said, okay, 2300 years. Um, and, and of course, it's BC 333 was when Alexander actually fought uh, Darius at um, the Battle of Issus in modern day Turkey today. And if you do the math, and I actually had to do it by hand because I'm not very good with numbers, you come out with 1967. And, of course, we say, well, what happened in 1967? Well, that's when the Jews retook Jerusalem in a six-day war, and on the seventh day, they rested. And that, to me, is just amazing. In fact, when I did this as a young man, I literally went, nah, that's not right. And I reached over, and I grabbed my calculator, and I punched it in, and I did it all over again. I said, no, it's the same number. And I did the math like two or three times just to make sure I wasn't dreaming this up, because... Um, Bishop Newton doesn't tell you. I had his book. My dad had given me this book to look at. And, and I had his book, and he doesn't say 1967 or 1966 or 1968. He just says around the sixth millennium. Um, so I literally worked it out for myself and was just gobsmacked. The hair on the back of my head stood up because this was such a phenomenal time period is that after 2,300 years the sanctuary would be cleansed and the host would no longer be trodden underfoot. And of course, we know the Jews have been going back to the land for a period of time. 1948, the, the Jews were back in the land, but the, the Temple Mount was still in Arab hands. And it wasn't until 1967 in the Six-Day War that that was actually freed from their hands. And so it's interesting because in 1955, a Christadelphian, uh, a guy named uh, Fred Bilton, he had written, basically, because Jerusalem, i.e. old Jerusalem, must be possessed by the Jews prior to Christ's return so that he might manifest himself to them as their deliverer and savior, the ejection of the Jordanians, Hashemite Jordan as it was called, um, from there is a foregone conclusion. We can look then for a development which will result in Israel getting possession of the whole city and for a dreadful conv conflagration kindled by that spark throughout the Middle East. So it's amazing that, you know, Brother Bilton in 1955, reading Eureka and, and Elpis Israel, kind of came up with the same conclusion that this has to happen. Um, but what's even more amazing is that Thomas Newton actually pegged the date. And it was just simply him sitting there going like, okay, well, this is what makes sense to me. The ram smites the goat. This was the year it happened. You go on 2,300 years, and, and that would bring you to 1967. What is really cool about that is that there was nothing in it for him. He wasn't trying to press the time period to end in his day. 
actually, if anything, it was counterproductive. It was like, okay, well then, then Jerusalem's not going to be free till 1967. I'm going to be long dead by then. Um, but he understood the time period. He worked it out, and that's what he uh, basically came up with. So that's to me an amazing time period that puts us today in the end game. And if we just think about that for a moment, it's pretty amazing because in Ezekiel. We read in chapter 38 and verse 8, in the latter years, so we're now in those latter years, thou shalt come into the land that is brought back from the sword and is gathered out of many people against the mountains of Israel, which have always been waste, but is brought forth out of the nations, and they shall dwell safely, all of them. And so that's the picture that we're given. It's the latter years that when Go comes down, it's against the mountains of Israel, which have always been waste. And they're going to come and they're going to dwell there and they're going to come from all the nations, going to be gathered out of many people, fulfilling the prophecy of Luke, fulfilling the prophecy of Daniel and queuing up Ezekiel chapter 38 verse 8 to take place. What's also interesting is that the prophet Joel picks up on the same exact issue. In Joel chapter 3, in at verse 1, he says, Behold, in those days and in that time, when I shall bring again the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem, I will also gather all nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. And as the rest of the chapter rolls out, we have Armageddon taking place. Now, what is fascinating again is that it's when he brings the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem, then he's going to gather the nations. So until 1967, Armageddon couldn't happen. I mean, just think about that. It had to be that the, the Armageddon could not take place till 1967 because the Jews had to be back in the land and Israel had to be a nation. Judah and Jerusalem had to be restored and the mountains of Israel all had to be inhabited. And all of those things would have to happen in order for Armageddon to take place. But before Armageddon, and after those things, of course, we have the Lord Jesus Christ returning. So, again, uh, uh, quite a fascinating kind of coming together events that Joel couldn't happen. Uh, Daniel's picture had to kind of fulfill. The sanctuary had to be cleansed, so to speak, and that's a process that's still going to go on. The Lord has to come, and the Dome of the Rock has to be removed, and the kingdom has to be established, and the temple has to be built. Um, but we're in that end game period and before Armageddon, the Lord Jesus Christ returns. Now, let's go back and look at another um, time period and it's in the book of Hosea and it kind of ties right into this and it, it's kind of a fascinating one um, that gets overlooked a lot of times. Um, it's, it's one of the ones that really is quite helpful. It's a macro view, so it's the big picture view. And it comes up in Hosea chapter 6. And um, we read here in Hosea chapter 6 verse 1. Come, uh, let us return unto the Lord, for he hath torn and he will heal us. He hath smitten and he will bind us up. After two days he will revive us. In the third day he will raise us up and we shall live in his sight. Well, it was 700, 732 BC when Israel was taken captive. The ten tribes in the north and of course the rest of them later on. So if you go two days, um, and uh, it shouldn't say 732 the second time there, if you go two days, um, basically it brings you to the time period of the, the end of the second day. So we're into the 1600s or whatever the number exactly is, or 1700s. Um, but he says after that period, at some point after that, so shortly after this when Thomas Newton actually was alive, um, he says that God would revive us, and in the third day, he would raise us up. Well, we are in the middle of the third day, if we number that from the time period of when Israel went into captivity. And even if you moved it up 100 plus years to the time period of, of uh, Babylon coming and taking them away in 611, um, you're still in the time period of, of that third day. And we're in the middle of the third day. And of course, a day is with the Lord is a thousand years. So after two days, he will revive us. And the third day, he's going to raise us up. 
So that is the time period in which we're living. Macro picture is in the third day. And that's the time period when he's going to raise Israel up once again. And of course, we have that picture in Ezekiel chapter 37. He assembles the body together. Bone comes to his bone. They're lying there. Flesh and sinews come upon them. But they still, the questions asked, son of man, can these bones live? And of course, what happens is he breathes into the slain and they stand upon their feet an exceeding great army. So they are revived and they live on the third day, which is the epoch in which we are, the macro picture. So what about, though, this, this going back to 1967, just, just dropping back into this picture that we had there of um, the fig tree, because we talked about this last week a little bit. Let's just take a, a, a quick review of this, going back into Luke chapter 21. So if you want to turn there, feel free to do this. Um, Luke chapter 21 um, we have this picture of the fig tree. The parable is, behold the fig tree and all the trees. When they now shoot forth, you see, you see and you know of yourselves that summer is nigh at hand. So likewise ye, when you see these things come to pass, know the kingdom of God is nigh at hand. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words will not pass away. Now we know that the primary application is A.D. Uh, 70, um, when the Lord is giving this prophecy is around AD 33. Um, and of course, there is going to be judgment that takes place. Um, and if you're 20 years old, so we talk about this generation. And under the law, a generation was numbered from 20 years old and up. So remember the 40 years of the wilderness wandering, it was limited to those 20 years old and under uh, or those 20 years old and up would die in the wilderness. Those under 20 years uh, were not considered responsible, and they would basically um, exist into that uh, next generation that would go into the kingdom, so to speak, into the, the land of Israel. Um, so numbering from 20, if you were 20 years old in AD 33, when this prophecy was given, you would be 57 in AD 70 when these things would come to pass. But it's not just about that, because notice there, he says, you know the kingdom of God is nigh at hand. So this has, we believe, a dual application. We, we believe that in using those words, you can certainly see a second application to this. Well, we know that there was a process in for Luke 21. You had the restoration of the people. It was to give both the sanctuary and the people to be trodden underfoot. Well, in 1948, the nation was reborn. If you were 20 years old in 1948, you would be 92 today. And there are some Christadelphians who were 20 years old in 1948, and they are 92 today, although that generation is quickly dwindling away. But if we remember the real context of Luke 21 and the treading down of Jerusalem, um, and we look at that as the beginning time period, 1967, the end of the time of the Gentiles, if you were 20 years old in 1967, you would be 73 years old in 2020, which basically means that your lifespan, so to speak, as numerated by the Bible, has come to a completion. That generation is beginning to pass. Now, in our days, modern technology and medicine is keeping people a lot alive a lot longer, and um, for that, many are thankful. And it certainly is that there are some that are going to be older than that. But the point is, we are in that time period. We are absolutely in the time period of the time of the end, the end of the time of the Gentiles. 1967, this generation shall not pass. They're 73 years old today. So we know that we're in that time period. And that's where I think we can, we can have some confidence in those things, using those time periods in the same way, and looking at them to say, yes, it did apply in AD 70 because that generation did not pass. But we also can make a second application to it, to our time period, and say we know that we are in that time period. And um, that's where we have in the book of Revelation. Um, and let's just turn there now really quickly to Revelation chapter 16 because we are living in the period of the sixth vial. Um, and it's between verses 14 and 16. So if you look at verse 14, 
we read there that the frog spirits are going out. They're going to gather the nations to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. So the frog spirits, the liberty, equality, fraternal, again, it's a whole fraternity. It's a whole other class. Um, those are the forces in the world, humanistic, socialistic, and all the different istic forces that are coming together. And they're gathering nations to the, the battle of the great day of God Almighty. Um, and then verse 16 he gathers them together to a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. Now, in between, sandwiched in between those two events, we have, Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. So we, as we see, 1967, Judah and Jerusalem are now in the hands of the Jews. That allows for Joel's prophecy to take place. It allows for Ezekiel chapter 38 to take place. But before those things can take place, and as the nations are gathering to Armageddon, we have the Lord Jesus Christ saying, Behold, I come as a thief. So that's kind of just a, a couple of time periods. We're going to look at some more in just a moment. But I thought we'd just pause for a minute um, for any questions based on what we've looked at. Um, we can't get too sticky deep into it because there's some other stuff we want to look at um, but let's just uh, open up the microphone if you want to ask a question um, I can see on the screen here um, anybody who uh, unmutes their mic um, I can't see your face but I could see your mic go unmuted so if you have a question or a comment please feel free to ask that now I have a question yes I'm not I'm not following it well Generally, I'm following it, but I'm just wondering, why is the timing of the 2,300 years? 333. That's a good question. Let's roll on back to um, Daniel chapter 8, and let's just look at that for a moment. Um, the reason it begins there is because the, where he says in verse... Um, uh, 13, when the one saint speaks to the other saint, and he says, how long shall be the vision? And then you've got the daily sacrifice, the transgression of desolation, to give both the sanctuary and the, and the host to be trodden underfoot. So the question is, how long is the vision that ends up with the sanctuary and the host being trodden underfoot? And that's where the, the, the conundrum comes, is how long is this, is this vision? So when you go back and you say, well, what is the vision actually all about? And you come back to the first couple of verses, Daniel sees a, a ram standing. Now, it had been pushing westward, southward, eastward, and so on and so forth. And, and it had become great, but now it is standing. And verse 5, as he was considering, a he-goat came from the west on the face of the earth. And what it does is it smites the ram. So what Newton did was he turned around and said, that's the vision. So the vision is the ram smiting the goat. When did that event happen? What was the, what was the event that saw the ram smiting the goat? And that event really, the big battle that took place, Alexander the Great basically began a tax revolt and, and left Macedonia, got all of Greece behind him, and they crossed the Hellespont into basically what we would today call Turkey, Turkey um, from Greece over into Turkey. And basically, um, they had this battle. There was a skirmish that took place when they first crossed the river. Um, but the, the full-out battle where Alexander the Great won against Darius the Mede was at Issus in the year 333 BC. So that's why um, Newton turned around and said, that's the time period that this whole vision begins. It's got to be with um, when the ram smites the goat, which was the year he had it as 334, the crossing of the Hellespont, but 333 is when the big battle actually took place. So that's the reason why that it, that it is actually uh, numerated from that period of time. And that, of course, going 2,300 years brings you directly to 1967. I'm Uncle uh, Jonathan. Yes. Just had a uh, question about um, the um, AD 33. I think I missed um, what year that is. I'm just wondering, are you um, like, are you assuming that's when when Christ died, or? Yeah, it's 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 in a. Um, 
it's in the time period, Seth, where basically it's the, let me see if I can just skip back to that slide for a second. Um, okay, so 70 weeks are determined, and those are the weeks and the years that are given there. So um, what we have here um, is the idea of, it's, it's 70 weeks that would happen beginning in 456 BC, and it ends at the end in AD 33. Now I can send you, I've got a, um, I, what I've got is a, uh, uh, a handout on this actually, it's like almost like a Bible insert I can send you through that gives you a lot more detail to this and kind of tells the whole story of that. So I'll send that through to you and um, you'll be able to have a look at that as well. So um, I'll, I'll flick that off to you so you've got a copy. If anybody wants one, by the way, you can email me and I'll just um, send that out to you if you want to have a copy of that so that everybody has it. All right. If there are no more questions, and feel free to interrupt me if there is, we will just roll on um, to the next little section. I just need to get rid of this little thing off my screen and now it's gone on the wrong screen. There we go. Gone. All right, so we're going to go on to consider now another one of the time periods. And um, it is basically the seven times which comes in the book of Daniel. So if you want to turn in your Bibles to um, Daniel, actually begins first of all in Leviticus chapter 26. I think we'll go there first. So there's, there's two periods of seven times. One has to do with the children of Israel. Um, the kingdom of Israel, so to speak, I guess you could say. And the other one has to do with the kingdom of Babylon. So these are the two time periods that we're going to look at. So the first one um, that, that is given to us is basically um, in Leviticus, I believe it is Leviticus chapter 26. So yes, it is. So uh, Leviticus chapter 26 and verse 18 reads, If ye will not hearken to all or unto me, then I will punish you seven times more for your sins. So there are seven times of punishment for Israel's sins if they wouldn't listen to God, right? So when we look at times, a time, biblically speaking, is a year, right? So when we, we say it like a time times and half a time, as we're going to look at in a moment, it's a, it's a, it's a year um, which is 360 days according to the ancient calendar. Okay, so whenever it's used in the biblical times, it's 360 days. So a, a year is 360 days, and, um, and they had months that they would throw in to correct this um, over a period of time in the Jewish calendar. So that's the one time period. And the second one is to do with Daniel's um, vision, or actually not Daniel's vision, it's, it's the vision of Babylon, or the king of Babylon, Daniel chapter 4. And uh, he is told here, this is Nebuchadnezzar, who says he built great Babylon. He says, let his heart be changed, verse 16, a man's heart, uh, sorry, uh, from man's, and let a beast's heart be given unto him, and let seven times pass over him. And this whole thing's going to go on. You've got the, the, tr the tree that's hewn down and its roots are banded or its stump is banded with iron and brass, which, of course, is the Greek and the Romans. And basically, it's until seven times pass over. And it's the time period that Nebuchadnezzar would become a beast, right? So when you think of Daniel 7, you have the four beasts. Well, the, the time period of the four beasts is this time period. And so... It's an interesting time period because you've got seven times that are going to pass over. So one time would be 360 years, two is 720, and so on and so forth. Seven times is 2,520 years, which is simply seven times 360. And I guess it would have helped if I had put the verse on there. So let's take a look at this, these seven times, right? They're going to pass over the king of Babylon. And uh, this is kind of an interesting um, thing to look at it. It's again, it's one of the ones that gets overlooked a little bit, but we just want to follow through some of the math. Now, there are multiple ways you can look at this. There were the 10 tribes that were taken in BC um, 723, and 10 or 7 times would pass, would bring you to 1796, which is about the time of the French Revolution. Um, if you went from Josiah's great Passover, the last major 
uh, biblical religious event that we read about, you would come from 628 to 1891. Um, and so those are the two time periods typically that brethren look at when we look, talk about the seven times of Israel's uh, tra tribulation. So typically it's taken from the ten tribes, but um, we also have, well, not just typically, it's actually typically taken from the great Passover. But, but those are two of those time periods. And the second one is, you know, the, the times of Nebuchadnezzar. So a lot of people look at 60, 611 when Nebuchadnezzar's reign began, and it brings you to 1908. Brother Thomas actually looked at that time period. Then there was the fall of Jerusalem and the temple was burned. Um, that was uh, 586, which would bring you to 1933, which is kind of the, the Second World War. Um, but what I ended up doing was actually looking at Nebuchadnezzar's dream and saying, well, when did Nebuchadnezzar have the dream? And let's follow that through 2,520 years. And that actually brings you to 1948, which is supremely interesting. So again, um, just something to keep in mind is that basically we have in here a time period that as we roll forward brings us all the way through from Nebuchadnezzar having the dream in 571 when he went in his seven years of um, actual uh, beast-like behavior if we took that as the seven times and when we followed it from that same time period, it brings you to 1948, which obviously is of great significance. Now, it doesn't really matter which one you take. Each answer gives you we are in that end time, the time when the kingdom of men is coming to a close. And that's just a, a point to make on this. No matter which date you start from, we come to the end of the kingdom of men. I'm in favor, honestly, of the last one, taking it from Nebuchadnezzar's dream, because it hits 1948, which, of course, we know um, was the time period when Jerusalem, or not Jerusalem, but Israel as a nation would be revived. Um, so, nonetheless, um, that's another one of those time periods. Now, and again, I apologize if, if we're kind of like throwing numbers at you left, right, and center. Um, if anybody wants any of these slides, please feel free to email me and I will send you through um, copies of them uh, so you can kind of go back and look at them in more detail. Um, I think the point that we're looking at here is it doesn't really matter which time period you examine. Um, we're in the end of days. So let's take a look at the next one which is the time, times, and the dividing of time, which comes from Daniel chapter 7. So um, we're going to dive in to Daniel chapter 7. This is the beast. Remember, Nebuchadnezzar was turned into a beast for those seven times. And these beasts, the four beasts, will take us right the way through from the time of Nebuchadnezzar until the return of the Lord Jesus Christ when he puts an end to the kingdom of men. And so that is the seven times, but there are other time periods that are given in the vision of Daniel chapter 7. So we're going to jump into Daniel chapter 7, and we want to take a look then at the beasts that come up on the, off the great sea. So in verse uh, 2, Daniel spake and said, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, four winds of the heavens drove upon the sea, and four great beasts came up on the sea, different one from the another. Uh, these beasts which, which arose, they are four kings which shall arise out of the earth. So we know the story. We have the Babylonian lion, the Medo-Persian bear, the Greek leopard, and that Roman fourth beast. And they all came up out of the sea. And those are the beasts, basically, that um, would be in existence in one form or another until the time the Lord Jesus Christ returns. Now, we know, of course, they correlate very much with uh, the image that Daniel saw in uh, Daniel chapter 2, um, where we had, of course, uh, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome, basically, which would turn into Europe, the, the feet of iron and clay. And these four beasts would correlate with the four stages of the image. And we want to focus in on this last phase, which is the Roman sort of European phase, and we want to look at the little horn. So if you look in your Bible um, and you see verse 7 um, is the arriving of this little horn. This is Daniel chapter 7. And we see here that we have onto the scene coming um, this great, dreadful, and terrible beast. 
So here is the picture that's given. I considered, we read, and um, there is there this, um, came up among them a little horn before there were three other horns that were plucked up by the roots. So we have a little horn that pops up and the other horns are plucked up by the roots. And we read here, I beheld the same horn made war with the saints and prevailed against them until the Ancient of Days came. And so that's the, the point. It lasts, it makes war, it plucks up these, these other horns, and it lasts until the Ancient of Days came, and then it's going to be destroyed. Judgment was given to the saints of the Most High, and the time came that the saints possessed the kingdom. So this horn is in existence until the saints come along and they destroy um, this horn and they possess the kingdom. So you've got the kingdom of man, which is represented by Daniel's image, by the four beasts, which is going to exist for a period of time, and then it is going to be destroyed by the kingdom of God. So you either got the kingdom of men or you've got the kingdom of God. It's one or the other. And so what happens here is that it goes on until the Ancient of Days came and judgment is given to the saints of the Most High. And the time comes that the saints possess the kingdom. So we want to look at the time period that's given to us then of this little horn. So in Daniel chapter 7, and at verse 25, we read there, He shall speak great words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change times and laws, and they shall be given into his hand until a time and times and the dividing of time. So as we mentioned, when we look at this, a time is 360 years. Times would be 2 times 360 years. And the dividing of the time would be half of 360 years. So we have 360 plus 720 plus 180, which gives us 1260 years. That's the time period of this beast, or oh, sorry, of this little horn, when it is going to be all powerful. Now, when does that begin and when does it end? That's the big question, really, that we have in front of us. Where do we start this and where does it finish? It's 1260 years, but what is the time period that this is all about? So in the book Exposition of Daniel um, by Brother John Thomas, um, he puts out some ideas on what he thinks this might be all about. So Exposition of Daniel is also called Anatolia written in around 1867. I don't expect you to be able to read this on the screen, um, but basically I'll just summarize it for you. He says the 1260 years are the time period of the domination of the Latino Babylonian power, which is called, of course, the papacy. So he begins this dissertation on when do we take this period from. Now he uses the decree of focus in the year 606 to 607. Right? And he says, really, we should take this time period from 606 to 607 um, and we'll follow it out from there, at the end of which um, he believed would come the end of the, uh, the kingdom of Babylon and the little horn would be destroyed. And using the decree of focus, he put it right into his own time period and saw basically that um, he believed the resurrection was imminent and it would happen in the next few years and the little horn power would be destroyed eventually about 30 years after that, 40 years after that, actually. Now, he got it wrong in, in that sense. And a lot of people have said, see, Brother Thomas, he got it wrong. He got the time period wrong um, and kind of throw a lot of dispersion on him for that. Um, I don't think that's really fair, um, considering the fact that so many of the other things he got right um, he was just looking at when did this whole thing take place and he kind of put a start date to it and came up with an end date and, and he was a little bit out on that end date. Great things happened around that time period. You had, of course, the, um, the uh, Napoleon and Garibaldi and, and those different ones who would take the Pope captive and would take away his temporal power in and around the time period Brother Thomas was looking for. Um, but it wasn't exactly right. And it was interesting, uh, Brother Paul Myers in, uh, in the Brantford Ecclesia did a lecture just the other week and uh, reminded me of something that I'd looked at years ago and kind of forgotten about. 
Um, I have a little book uh, by a guy named Isaac Newton. And Isaac Newton wrote a little bit earlier, actually, than Thomas Newton. They're not related. Isaac Newton, this is the scientist Isaac Newton. And I was very thankful. I wrote to Brother Stephen Snowblin, and uh, he gave me some of the references. And what's interesting is, is that Isaac Newton, was. these are just his own private personal notes. Um, so he wasn't publishing this for any reason other than he was just sitting there trying to work it out. And these are kind of notes that he wrote down to try and figure out this time period. And... Um, and this is what he came up with. And, and I will read you this one. So this is um, Isaac Newton, um, Observations on the Prophecies of Daniel and the Apocalypse of St. John. He says, So then, the time, times, and half a time are 42 months, or 1260 days, or three years and a half, reckoning 12 months to uh, the year and 30 days to the month, as was done in the calendar of the primitive year. So he's kind of giving you the little asterisk. This is where it comes from. The primitive calendar was 360 days. So he's just telling you that. And the days of the short-lived beast being put for the years it lived, uh, the kingdoms basically that is, the period of 1260 days, if dated from the complete conquest of the three kings, which would be around 800, um, should end or will end in around 2060. Um, it may end later, but I have no reason for it ending sooner. This I mention not to assert when the time of the end shall be, but to put a stop to the rash conjectures of people in his day who are throwing at all kinds of dates and times and whatever else. Um, he says, Christ comes as a thief in the night, and it is not for us to know the time and season which God hath put in his own breast or his own power. And of course, we have looked at the fact that he says you will receive power, and that's the book of Revelation. So we don't know the day or the hour, but we do have a general idea of the time and the season. So that's pretty interesting. And it's interesting in a couple of reasons. Number one, there was nothing in, him, in it for him, again, like Thomas Newton, in coming up with this date. Um, he was just sit simply sitting there working it out and saying, well, if we started at 800, which to me makes a lot of sense because the vision we just looked at was when the three horns would be plucked up and when the little horn would basically put in its place. And that happened when Charlemagne came along and he was crowned, I think it was Christmas Day, 1799. So basically the beginning of 800, um, not 1799, 799, so around 800, just as the year changed, the Pope was given that temporal authority, and all Newton did was take take that year, add 1260 to it, you end up in around uh, 2060. Now, that's fascinating, and, and you might think, well, 2060, I got tons of time, yeah, I got 40 years to sort stuff out. Well, not so fast, because you see, it's everything else that has to take place that we are given times and periods for. Um, are there any questions just on the um, the Thomas Newton or the Bishop Newton um, time period um, that we're given there just before we roll any further? Okay, I will keep rolling. Um, and if anybody wants to ask a question, just, just pop in. So we want to look at this then and just consider what's being told to us here. Um, because it's this 1260 years that go all the way out to the year 2060, according to Thomas Newton, or Isaac Newton, sorry. Um, we know that there's the resurrection and the judgment. And we're told, basically, that the judgment is going to take about a 10-year period. Now, we're going to talk about that from in a moment. Um, but... There's then Armageddon, and um, Armageddon basically is going to take place. And then there's a series of other events. Um, I just want to share with you why it is believed that the judgment is 10 years. Because sometimes we hear that, but we don't always understand, or I certainly didn't for a long time, what's the rationale? And I kind of dismissed it because I didn't understand the rationale as to why the judgment period would be 10 years. And it's not that the judgment seat itself takes a literal 10 years, but there's events during that judgment seat uh, time period um, before we get into Armageddon. Now, the first one comes in Numbers, and it's Numbers chapter 10. And this is where this whole idea of a 10-year period goes. There were two trumpets of silver, 
that were to be made for the calling of the assembly. So it's the gathering of the assembly together that they were to blow them for the journeying of the camp. So when they will blow them, all the assembly shall assemble themselves to the, the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. If they blow with one trumpet, the princes, which are heads of the thousands, shall gather themselves unto thee. So this was the key back in Numbers, is that the trumpets were to assemble the children of Israel together, which is interesting um, because, of course, we have the dead uh, being raised by the trump. Uh, the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised. We looked at that last week. So it's for the calling of the assembly. It's calling the saints out of the earth, calling those that are alive and re remain together with them to be with the Lord. So that's what the trumpets were there for. Now, Leviticus, if you just turn in your Bible over to Leviticus, um, we look here at the time periods of the blowing of the trumpet, of when these would take place. So in Leviticus chapter 23, and at verse 24, we're told, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, in the first day of the month, ye shall have a Sabbath, a memorial of blowing of trumpets, a holy convocation. So the first trumpet was blown on the seventh day or the, the first day of the seventh month and it was to gather the assembly together, right? So that's the first trumpet. So we're talking about this is coming up to the time of the atonement, the day of atonement, right? And the first trumpet was seven days or on the seventh month, the first day of the month for the gathering of the assembly together. And as we looked at last week, in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 51, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. So the first trumpet is for the gathering of the assembly. It's the resurrection trumpet. So that's number one. Now the second trumpet back in Leviticus chapter 25 he says, thou shalt cause the trumpet of the jubilee to sound on the tenth day of the seventh month. In the day of atonement shall you make the trumpet sound throughout all the land. So they had the second trumpet sounding on the day of atonement, ten days after the first trumpet. So the deduction is that if the first trumpet sound is the resurrection, and 10 days later is the second trumpet, which is the Day of Atonement, then we have a 10-day period between those two events. And taking the prophetic day for a year, we have 10 years. And that's where the concept of 10 years of a judgment period takes place. Because what happens after that, or as we kind of go along with this, in Isaiah 27, verse 13, it shall come to pass in that day that the great trumpet shall be blown, and they shall come which were ready to perish in the lands of Assyria, the outcast, the land of Egypt, and shall worship Yahweh in the mount at Jerusalem. So we have here the Day of Atonement. And what was the happening on the Day of Atonement? Well, it was the Day of Jubilee, right? It was when the captives were released. And Isaiah says that they blow this great tr trumpet. Those who are ready to, to perish are released. The outcasts come um, basically out of all the places to worship Yahweh in the Mount uh, in Jerusalem. And so that's the concept that basically uh, would take place, is that 10 years would be that time period at the beginning is the resurrection, the end of which is working now with the, the people of Israel, people coming back into the land, and the, the redemption trumpet being sounded for the people of Israel. So um, that's that little block of time, that 10 years. And when we start looking at that and saying, okay, there's other principles that come to play here. If the saints are raised and we have judgment taking place, however long that is, um, one of the things that we know has to fit into that 10-year time period is a time for a man to be with his wife. Um, and this comes out of Deuteronomy chapter 24 and at verse 5. When a man takes a new wife, he shall not go out to war, neither shall he be charged with any business. He shall be free at home one year and shall cheer up his wife, which he hath taken. So the concept is, is that when the Lord takes his bride... The, the, the Lord Jesus Christ takes his bride, which is the ecclesia, there will be one year 
where they will be at home together, so to speak, where they will have a time period themselves um, for uh, getting to know each other, basically, uh, for learning the power of the Holy Spirit, as we talked about the other day. Um, so this is that time period of, of training where Christ is with his saints. Um, he's brought them back to him. And before he goes out to war, there is a period of a year. Now, the other thing we looked at last week is that basically you would have also Elijah the prophet. So we looked at this last week, Malachi 4, verses 5 and 6. I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of Yahweh, which will be at the end of those 10 years. Um, and he's going to turn the heart of the fathers of the children, the children to their fathers, lest they come and smite the earth with a curse. So that's what we looked at last week. Um, but the point is, is that fits into that time period because it's before Armageddon. It's before the Lord Jesus Christ goes out to war. There's going to be this period of teaching. Now, why do we tend to look at these things and, and do brethren tend to consider these types of events? Well, there's a principle um, that's laid out in the book of Micah. Um, so if you just come to Micah chapter 7 in verse 15, there's a principle here that is basically a prophetic pattern. Uh, Micah tells us that when Israel comes a second time out of the nations, in verse 15, it's going to be according to the days of thy coming out of the land of Egypt, will I show unto him marvelous things. So God is using the same pattern of time like he did when he brought Israel out of Egypt. So that's why brethren have taken these different uh, pieces and assembled them together to kind of put some kind of a timeline uh, together with, with all the events that have to take place. So you've got the year to be with the bride. You've got the three and a half year of the, um, of the, uh, the Elijah mission that's going to take place. Um, and you've got 40 years for the diaspora to return. And so when we, we look at this, um, Elijah's preaching really was during that time period that we read of in James chapter 5, verses 17 to 18, that his, he comes onto this, bursts onto the scene, and he speaks to um, you know, this great pronouncement that for the space of three and a half months, it wouldn't rain, three years and six months, it wouldn't rain. And then he prays again, and it rains, and of course, then we have Jezebel chasing him, and then we have the story of Elisha coming along to take over. But you have approximately three and a half years that Elisha, or Elijah, sorry, has his mission. And so the pattern is, well, if it was 40 years coming out of the wilderness, Elijah's to come a second time. His work was about three and a half years that he was visibly on the scene with Israel. Um, therefore, it will be three and a half years for the Elijah mission the second time around. So putting all those things together and going back to our chart that we've kind of put together, we have the resurrection and the judgment, the first trumpet sounding, and we have 10 years before that second trumpet sounds, at which point in time we're going to start getting into Armageddon. Fitting in to that first 10-year period then, we have three and a half years for the Elijah mission, or basically something along that lines. We have a year of comfort, um, Deuteronomy 24, verse 5. And then we have basically the period of judgment. Now, following this, um, we have the great battle of Armageddon. He gathers them together to a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. And of course, we have all the judgments of Armageddon taking place. So that's kind of the, the, the bookend to this first 10-year period. Um, before the coming of the great and dreadful day, Malachi tells us Elijah is going to come. Then we have the great and dreadful day, which is Armageddon, which God willing, we'll look at next week. Um, but plugging back into this and, and just looking at our time periods then, um, when we start to kind of break these things down and just think about them, we have Armageddon taking place um, is this this great event um, that is going to bookend those 10 years of judgment and the other things that we had talked about. So I just want to kind of jump ahead then and say, okay, well, what else has to take place after those 10 years of judgment, after we see Armageddon, um, before the world is judged, another event happens. Now, I just apologize. It's going to try and redraw everything on the screen here for you. So we got Elijah's mission, little review, three and a half years. Um, and then we have the year of comfort. And then we have basically the, uh, the judgment time period. And then we have something else taking place. So once we have Armageddon, 
and the Lord Jesus Christ is in Jerusalem, we then have the seventh angel who's going to pour out his vial. So I've come, if you would, to the book of Revelation in chapter 16. So the sixth vial is Armageddon. Um, it's all part of that sixth vial. The seventh vial comes in Revelation chapter 16 and verse 17. The seventh angel pours out his vial into the air, and there comes a great voice out of the temple of heaven saying, or from the throne saying, it is done, right? So that's the, the end of this time period, it is done. And what happens then is that the, the nations are going to be brought into judgment. Great Babylon is going to come into judgment. But before that, if we come back over the page to Revelation chapter 14, we have here a picture that's given to us. And again, we've looked at this just briefly. We have in verse 1, the Lamb standing on Mount Zion with the 144,000 with their Father's name written in their foreheads. Right. So here we have Jesus, the Lamb, on Mount Zion, and the saints are with him. Well, that was Zechariah chapter 14. The Lord my God will come and all the saints with thee. They're now in Mount Zion, right? And so they're about now to establish the kingdom. Armageddon's taken place. The battle has taken place. But now the great cry is going to go out into all of the earth. And we read about that in Revelation chapter 14 and verse 6. He says, I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to them that dwell on the earth, to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. So judgment is always preceded by warning from God. I just leave you this note as a, as a footnote. When David um, saw the angel standing between the heaven and the earth, he was ready to bring judgment. Well, here we have an angel in the midst of heaven. So we think about, well, what does that mean? We talked about this last time. It's the mid-heaven proclamation. You have the heaven and the earth that is now, Donald Trump and Trudeau and Boris Johnson, if he makes it, and a few others, right? So those are the rulers right now. And then you have um, the Lord Jesus Christ and the saints that are coming, right? So between those two heavens, one's going to drop and the Son of Righteousness will arise and the saints with him. Between those two heavens, we have the Lord Jesus Christ sending out this great proclamation to all the earth. Um, and this is what it says. He says with a loud voice, fear God, give glory for him for the hour of judgment is come. And now notice this, worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. Now, just a little asterisk there. Brothers and sisters and young people, do not waste your time with questions that minister strife rather than godly edifying, such as theistic evolution. When the rainbowed angel comes and this mid-heaven proclamation is made, the people are told, worship him that made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and the fountains of waters. Of all time periods to say that, worship the creator is in our evolutionist time period in which we live. All of that's going to be wiped away and God is going to call all nations to um, respect him and to basically come in to um, worship him. Now, let's go back to Psalm 2. We looked at this very briefly the other week because the response of the nations is given to us there in Psalm 2. And verse 6 is kind of the mid-heaven proclamation. So Psalm 2, verse 6. I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion... I will declare the decree, Yahweh said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Ask of me, and I will give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron, thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Now notice, be wise now therefore, O ye kings, be instructed, ye judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear, and, and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry, and ye perish from the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all those who put their trust in him. So here's the point, is that they are told here, you know, I've set my, whole, my king upon my holy hill of Zion, bow down before him. So that's the mid-heaven proclamation. You know, serve God, you know, that made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the waters, and so on and so forth. Well, the re reaction of the nations is actually given to us earlier in the chapter, in verse 1. The nations rage, the people imagine a vain thing, the kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against Yahweh and against his anointed, against his Messiah, 
And they say, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. And of course, God is going to have them in derision and he's going to vex them in his sore displeasure. So that's the point that the Midheaven proclamation goes out and, you know, God says, this is what I'm going to do. And then he turns around and gives the nations warning. The nations are going to rebel. That is also picked up if you come over in your Bible to Revelation chapter 17. This is the picture of the great harlot who rides the beast, right? So this is uh, Revelation 17. This is the picture of Daniel's beast in its last phase in the book of Revelation. And the great beast with the seven horns, or sorry, the seven heads and ten horns. And we read of the ten horns in verse 12. The ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings or ten kingdoms, which have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. These have one mind and give their power and strength to the beast. But notice the time period. One hour is all they've got. And they're going to make war with the Lamb. And the Lamb will overcome them, for he is Lord of lords and King of kings. And those that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. And we had a little chat this week with some about this phrase, called, chosen, and faithful. We had that verse in Matthew, many are called, few are chosen. How do I know if I've been you know, chosen well, it's simply if you're faithful to the call. That's all it means. So those that are with him are those who are faithful to the call. So all of us have been called. Our children are called by the gospel that is administered to them by their parents. And basically, whether they're chosen is going to depend on if they are faithful. And of course, they're going to make war with the lamb, but the lamb is going to come along and he is going to overcome them. But I want to hone in on this time period that's given to us here this one hour. They are given one hour that they have power. And so we think of what the Lord Jesus Christ says. He says, are there not 12 hours in a day? And so that's a 12th of a cycle, right? So in a day, there are 12 hours, and this is one twelfth. And so these kings receive power one hour with the beast. And it's also the same specific period of judgment that's given to these different to this beast and to the harlot system. It's the specific period of judgment that is given to us in the book of Revelation. In chapter 18, we read there in verse 10, The nations stood afar off for fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, great Babylon, that mighty city, in one hour is thy judgment come. And in verse 17, in one hour, so great riches has come to nothing. And again in verse 19, in one hour, she is made desolate, right? So there is one hour that is basically the period that the, the kings will have power with the beast. And there's one hour of the judgment of the system. And those two time periods really are synonymous. They're in that same one. So four times it mentions this one hour period. So it's not by chance. And this is what Brother Thomas was referring to with that little passage. I'm just going to flip back on the screen because perhaps now it'll make a little bit more sense. Um, where he says the use of the word hour is very precise. It's not vague or indefinite. Uh, they are figurative of an exact number of solar years, right? So I won't read through his whole thing again, but this is what he basically is saying. One hour is a twelfth of time. A month is a twelfth of time. A month is a representative period of 30 day years. And consequently, an hour is representative of the same 30 day years. So these are equivalent time periods. And I realize this is a little on the complex side. Um, it's taken me a while to kind of get my, my noggin around it. But the point is, is that what, what he's doing is he's taking twelfths, right? So if you just try not to do this algebraically, algebra was invented by an Arab, right? Let's tr his actual name was algebra. Um, let's try and think of it more in the way God does it, the patterns that God lays down. So what God does is he says, okay, and think about this now, seven days are 7,000 years, right? So we have the 7,000 year plan of God on the earth. Now, seven days, if you take a day for a year principle, are also seven years. They're a week. There's, there's many different ways that God does this. He does the same thing with twelfths, right? So an hour is a twelfth of a day. A month is a twelfth of the time of a year. So they're both twelfths of a time period. And they basically equivalent. 
so that um, an hour is the equivalent of 30 day year periods in the divine uh, way of looking at things when it comes to uh, time periods. Now, one of the examples of this, um, and again, we're not going to go into all the detail, but in, in Revelation chapter 8, when he opens the seventh seal, that actually should be, yeah, maybe it is 8. Uh, Revelation chapter 8, he opened the, the seventh seal. There was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. Right, so before the trumpets begin to sound, so it is Revelation eight. There is a about a half hour time period, and historically that works out very accurately. Licinius dies um, in three twenty four, and for about fifteen years until Constantine dies, there is space, uh, a silence in heaven. So there's peace in the heavens for about a half an hour period. So that's just an example of how this this hour is 30 years, so half an hour is 15 years, and it fits right in in Revelation chapter 8 and verse 1. So when we come back to Revelation 17, and we consider basically that this harlot system is going to have one hour um, as ruling with the kings of the earth, with this beast, that's how long this whole thing is going to be in place, and then its judgment is going to come. And so the judgment is given in chapter 18, uh, verse 21, with violence, Babylon, that great city shall be thrown down and shall be no more. Our plagues are going to come, a mourning and famine and death. She's going to be utterly destroyed. She's going to be burned with fire for strong is the Lord God that judgeth her. And so that is the situation that Babylon the great is going to be destroyed. That's what the scripture dictates to us. And so when this all takes place um, is what we want to focus on. So we've kind of looked at a couple of things. Now I want to try and pull this together for a moment. I want to go back to what Brother Thomas says. He says this 30-year period then, so this one hour, this 30-year then begins um, or being the duration of the hour in, the place, in these places. The confederacy of the papal powers will continue 30 years during which judgment is being executed upon them by the people of the Holy Ones, who torment them with the calamities of war. These 30 years are the last years of Micah's 40, which we didn't even look at. We're not, we're not going to go back there. We did mention it. Um, after the coming out of um, Egypt, 40 years. Um, for the grinding and the shattering of the elements of the image to powder by the stone, and the ending of the annihilation of Babylon, at the expiration of its 2,520 years being about, he thought, 1878. Now, we're going to take what he says in the first part there and now take what um, Isaac Newton says about the 1260 years ending in 2060, right? So we're going to use that same time period, but we want to take Brother Thomas's rationale about those 30 years, what's going to happen. And so what we've got back in our chart now, and this time it's not going to redraw itself all over again, which is good. We have then Armageddon, what well, we have at the beginning, the 10 years of the judgment period. Um, we have the year of comfort, the three and a half years of the Elijah mission, the battle of Armageddon. And if we were to take basically what Thomas Newton said and said, okay, that Babylon falls in the year 2060, and we roll back and we say, okay, if there's 30 years of rebellion, uh, which is the same 30 years of judgment, that brings us back to 2030. And then we've got three and a half years of the Elijah mission, a year of comfort, and then the fulfilling the 10 years of the judgment period. That brings us back, of course, to 2020. So that's why that kind of caught me the other day when, when Brother Paul Myers mentioned this is because I hadn't looked at it in a while, but when you look at those time periods that Brother Thomas talked about and, and didn't quite get right, um, but then Isaac Newton had turned around and said, well, 2060 is the date, and you roll back from there and see, well, what are all the events that the Bible says has to happen? Because 2060 is when Babylon the Great falls, but there's 30 years of her ruling with the 10 kings of the earth and 30 years of God's judgments. Before those 30 years, you have the Mid-Heaven Proclamation. Before that, you have Armageddon. 
Before Armageddon, you have three and a half years of Elijah. Before that, you have a year of comfort. Before that, you have the judgment. Brings us all the way back using all those prophetic time periods that brethren have put together over the years to the year 2020. Now, that is obviously the year in which we live. These are patterns. These are times. We don't know the day or the hour. And there's the year here and a year there. It can be out a little bit here and out a little bit there. You know, the whole BC flipping over to AD. Um, there's lots of little nuances that you need to take into place. We don't know the day or the hour. But what we do know is this. It doesn't matter what time period you look at, whether we go right to the very beginning and we talk about the 7,000 year plan, we're in the last day. The millennial day is basically upon us. We've expired the 6,000 years of men. If we look at the time period that we talked about in Hosea, two years, basically, after two years, Israel would be revived. And in the third year, he would make us live again. We're in that third year. If we were to look at the time period of the, the 2300 days, from 333, 1967, the sanctuaries cleansed, the Lord will come at that point in time. Um, look up, lift up your heads for your redemption draws nigh. We're in that time period. Added to this generation will not pass. They're already in their 70s. So you take that time period, you take the 1260 uh, years that, that Thomas Newton, or sorry, um, Isaac Newton and Brother Thomas had talked about. If we start with Newton's number of 1260 and we work back, we're right in the end zone. So it doesn't matter which time period we take. Whatever angle you want to come from, we are absolutely in the very, very end of these time periods. And that's why I think the message to us really is, is pretty critical. And it comes in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 11. Everything around us, seeing then that all these things are going to be dissolved, what manner of persons ought we to be? In all holy conversation and godliness, looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of Lord. Everything around us is melting. It's, it's going. All the things that seem to be important are just dissolving. And God is making us realize that pretty soon they're all going to be gone. And in which case... What manner of persons ought we to be? All of this is going. What should we be doing? And I think that's been a great thing that this whole uh, crisis that's come upon us has made all of us realize is that we are at the absolute end of days. Uh, no matter which time period you want to use, the time and the season is now for the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Will it be this year? Maybe not. Maybe we're out by a year or so here or there. Um, but we know we're in the very, very end of that time period. And now is the time for us to make preparation to fill our lamps with oil. So when the Lord comes, we go out to meet him with joy. And what not running around saying like, oh, I, you know, my, my, my vessel is not full of oil. My lamp is going out and I don't know what to do. And then the door is shut and we are left out of that kingdom age. So um, I realize a lot of numbers tonight, a lot of different things. But the main point is as we look at this, is that we are absolutely in the end of days. There is no doubts about it. So let us redeem the time because the day is upon us. Hi, Jonathan. Could you just go through the 10-year judgment thing again, please? Because I got some of it written down, but I didn't get all of it. Not a problem. So I'm just going to... I got through the, the numbers, Leviticus and uh, 1 Corinthians part, but it was when... Uh, you then went to Leviticus 25, verse 9. The bit in between, I kind of got a bit lost. All right, so Leviticus 23, was it? Yep, 23, verse 24, yeah, let's try. Okay, so this was the, um, so just backing up a little bit, uh, I'll just flip through these ones again. So you have two trumpets. The first of which was for the gathering of the people, right? So you have the trumpets that were made and the blasts that were to be sounded. And then when we come to the Day of Atonement, um, which was basically that Leviticus 23, 24, one trumpet was blown on that day. You will blow a trumpet or a, um, the first trumpet that is blown, sorry. And it's not that there's two trumpets in this case. It's just that this is the first day on the seventh month. So there was a trumpet blown on day one, and then there was a trumpet blown on day 10. So we were saying the trumpet blown on day one 
is the trumpet for the resurrection because it was the gathering of the people together, right? So in, in 1 Corinthians 15, 51, the trumpet sounds, the dead are raised incorruptible and we're going to be changed, right? So that's the first uh, sounding of the trumpet. And then 10 days later, there is the trumpet of Jubilee that sounds on the 10th day of the seventh month. It's the day of atonement. And it's an atonement throughout all the land, this trumpet was sounded. And so on that day, um, the day of atonement was the day of the release, right? So if you think about it, this is where the slaves were set free um, on the 49th year. Um, the slaves would be set free. It's the year of release. Um, and basically the, the trumpet is sounded. And so it's 10 days between those two trumpets. And the point was is that using that same principle of a day for a year, there is 10 years from the resurrection to basically the time when the captives are set free, which is when the Lord Jesus Christ comes to the Mount of Olives, the Battle of Armageddon, and he comes to redeem his people. And that theme of the Redeemer is all the way through Isaiah. Um, it comes up over and over again. It comes up in Psalm 68 um, of the redeemed, the year of the redeemed has come. So that's 10 day years after the blowing of the first trumpet, which is the resurrection. And so that's kind of the picture that was in Isaiah 7 or 27, verse 13. Uh, the great trumpet shall be blown. They which were ready to perish in the land of Assyria, the outcasts and so on would come to worship Yahweh in the Mount at Jerusalem. So you're going to have the gathering together of the nations, basically, or the Jews from out of all of those nations. Um, but also the, the Jews in the land are going to be saved from the oppression of the Gogian host that's coming down. Because remember, it says, you know, a third um, a part would be taken into captivity. Um, not all of the city would be destroyed, but there would be people that would be saved in the city, but they're under the boot of the, the Russian host, um, and the Lord comes to deliver them. They will call to Yahweh, and he will hear them, and he will deliver them in that day. Brother Jonathan, do you think uh, 2070 would be when the temple would be dedicated? Well, it's entirely possible. I mean, there's the if you look at Armageddon, um, if we just spin back, just give me one second, let me find that uh, timeline again. If we look at the, um, the time period here, uh, where we have the, the hour, uh, the 30 years of rebellion, uh, Babylon Falls, um, 2060, so to speak. Um, and, and, again, and again, it depends, like how long was the temple going to be in building, right? That's the question, really, because it's from 2030, if, if these time periods, and again, I, I'm not being dogmatic on this. I'm just saying this is the work of our brethren and of Isaac Newton and kind of you pull it together. This is what you've got. Um, but if 2030 is when the building of the temple commences, um, a 40 year period would bring you to 2070. I'm just thinking that that would be 2000 years from when the temple was, was destroyed. destroyed. Yes. That would be apropos. Yeah. No. Now, why why do you use uh, eight hundred? I know that was the day of Charlemagne. What, what was what was particular on that day that you should start counting the twelve sixty? So that's the time period um, when the little horn um, basically takes its power. So if you go back to Daniel chapter seven, um, and we have there in verse eight, I considered the horns, and there came up a little horn. Um, before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn were the eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouse speaking great things. So it's that verse 11. I beheld because of the voice of the great words the horn spake um, that he is brought into judgment. And it's that little horn that comes to power. Um, in the point that was used um, was that that is the time period when Constantine came to power, or not Constantine, Charlemagne, sorry, came to power in the year 800. Um, that's when he was crowned by the Pope. That's when basically the whole formalization of the three uh, other horns being plucked off, basically him being given 
the uh, the it came originally through his father, but it was it was crystallized in Charlemagne at that point in time, um, and that's where that time period. That's where Isaac Newton basically took that time period from and said, "This is the period um, where we're going to number it from because of those events." And that's where that twelve hundred and sixty years basically starts from. That's that's the reason he used that. Brother Thomas used the decree of focus in six oh six and saw that time period expiring um, around his time period um, and believed that the resurrection would be almost imminent at that point in time. Um, I was just simply, you know, following uh, Thomas or Isaac Newton's thing on this and looking at the reason why he gave that, which to me kind of made a lot of sense. Um, and that's the reason why 800 is the year that's given. So, so there was a consolidation of three other kings. Correct into Charlemagne, and that's where, I guess, the Pope, uh, I guess he crowned him? Yeah, so it, it was the um, the Vandals, the Visigoths, and the Huns, basically, and this is what we call the, the Papal States, and all of this was really kind of came into to one with the birth of the Holy Roman Empire, where you have now Charlemagne as the military arm of the Holy Roman Empire, who would basically protect the Pope, um, and begin the Reich, the thousand-year reign of Christ's kingdom on earth as they saw it at the time period. Jonathan, I may have missed it because uh, I, I lowered the volume and talked to Betts for a minute. Um, but, oh, pardon me, <clears throat> Jim um, had mentioned about 2070 being, you know, wondering about the restoration of the temple. The interesting mathematical uh, thing that would support that would be the Feast of Tabernacles begins five days following the Day of Atonement. Yes. Which would equate to 50 years, which would be 2070 going by this chart. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah, I'll have to plug that in as well. And again, we don't know. I mean, like nobody knows the day or the hour. That's absolutely, you know, critical that we understand that. Um, the main thing I think is that we're, we just know that we're in the absolute end of days. Like there's, there's no other way to put it, um, that we are literally at the very, very crux of the return. The knife edge of the kingdom is really what it is. Yeah. I, I, uh, I wasn't sticking you to 2020. I was just meaning it, yeah. the, the path actually made sense with that too. And, uh. Yeah, it, was, it was a good thought Jim brought up. Yeah, no, it's, it is very interesting when you look at the pattern. That's one of the things I find quite upsetting about uh, some brothers and sisters' uh, attitude toward fossil days. Uh, over here in England, I've heard several people say they don't go to fossil days because they don't agree with brethren predicting the the date that Christ is going to return. And I've said to so many of them, you're, you're totally missing the point. It's not about that. Um, it's quite bizarre, really, that they seem to have that attitude. But these are people that never have been to a post today to actually find out for themselves what is actually discussed of them. I think, you know, we, we have to be cautious, Richard. I know for myself, you know, we, we have sometimes, you know, somebody will say you know, on this day, the Lord's going to return, you know, October or whatever it might be or something like that. I think we've got to be very careful of doing that because then that day comes and that day goes. And, you know, um, young people especially can be quite disillusioned. To me, it's not about, you know, putting a figure on it. So even with 2020, I always put a question mark beside it. It's just that this is the alignment of so many things. And to miss that, to me... Um, it's like the Lord says, he says, what I say unto you, I say unto all, watch, right? So we can't, we cannot miss that. And there's a great blessing that's given at the book of Revelation at the beginning. Blessed is he that readeth and, you know, those who basically understand it and keep the things that are written therein for the time is at hand. And that I could say has never been more apropos than now is that the time is at hand. Um, right at the door, and consequently, we have to do our utmost to understand where we are. Um, and the point of prophecy, uh, years ago, I think it was Brother Roberts who made the comment, prophecy is like smelling salts for the brain. 
right? It's to break us out of the apathy that we kind of get into in our day-to-day -day life and really kind of draw us out and wake us up to the day and age in which we are living that the Lord is actually at the door.